Well, gentlemen, when the shit hits the fan, some guys run and some guys stay. You know what there's a saying, that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Hell, I took it in the neck for my Brexit videos, page after page of people raging at me, but that's the price of doing what you think is right. I mean, damn, I could have just as easily done what was popular, trivially so, without even breaking a sweat. However, it takes a damn sight more than people calling me thundercuck or that I'm just doing it for self-interest or that scientists shouldn't be allowed to express political opinions they disagree with. You know, because being a scientist means that you shouldn't have a political opinion. Yet it takes a damn sight more than that or a million and other one things that don't actually make an argument to change my mind. And it takes a damn sight more than people chiding me about being salty to change my mind. But really, if that's the level of discourse you want, well, I'm sorry for triggering you. And feel free to go back to your safe space where you can be happy that there are no conflicting opinions in your echo chamber. But for everyone else who agrees or disagrees or wants to give reasons why they actually agree or disagree, or if you just wanna hear what I have to say, cool. It's good to see that there are some free thinkers in the wide world. So, a couple of weeks after the UK voted marginally to leave the European Union, if you can't see the writing on the wall yet, let me just give you a head count. Within 24 hours of declaring that the uh, 23rd of June was going to be Independence Day. If we vote leave and take back control, I believe that this Thursday can be our country's Independence Day. Boris Johnson, the de facto leader of the uh, Leave campaign, was saying how important it was to make sure that we were closer than ever to Europe. In voting to leave the EU, it is vital to stress that there is now no need for haste, and indeed, as the Prime Minister has just said, nothing will change over the short term. And to those who may be anxious, whether at home or abroad, this does not mean that the United Kingdom will be in any way less united, nor indeed does it mean that it will be any less European. That this Thursday can be our country's Independence Day. We cannot turn our backs on Europe. We are part of Europe. Indeed, there was so much backpedaling that if he'd been promising that stuff just one week earlier, you would have thought he was campaigning to remain in Europe, not being the de facto leader of the Leave campaign. The second point I want to make, because I've seen a lot of confusion over the weekend about uh, the status of people living in this country. It's absolutely clear that people uh, from other European countries who are living here have their rights protected. All that people want to see is a system that's fair, impartial and humane to all people coming from around the world. Oh, what? You mean, Boris, we need something kind of like, oh, what's the name of it? The European Union? And also, obviously, people from uh, the UK living abroad, living in the, in the rest of the EU, uh, will also have their rights completely protected. I, I just worry there's been a certain amount of, of confusion in the media over the last, over the last 24 hours. Thanks a lot, folks. And a day or two after that, he had gone from the favoured new leader of the Tories, after, of course, the Prime Minister resigned, to announcing that he wasn't going to be running at all. You who have waited faithfully for the punchline of this speech, and in view of the circumstances in Parliament, I have concluded that person cannot be me. But I know what you're thinking. It's easy to predict these things with the benefit of hindsight. I mean, after all, everyone is a general after the battle. It would have meant so much more if you'd have actually said these things before he'd resigned. What, you mean like uh, this? And the thing that's maybe remarkable about this footage is this is one of the lead Brexters in his moment of triumph, his great moment of victory. And yet he is the demeanor of a broken man who has just lost the biggest battle of his life. But what about Farage, leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party? Surely he's hardcore, right? He'll keep on fighting for the independence of the United Kingdom from Europe. He's a believer. He's not gonna back down, right? 
I mean, let's ignore the fact that on the night of the referendum, when Farage thought that he was going to marginally lose... Tonight, whatever the result, is not one for recriminations, but for a celebration that the landscape of British politics in the course of the last few weeks has changed. Win or lose this battle tonight, we will win this war. We will get our country back. We will get our independence back and we will get our borders back. Thank you. But the quote here in the mirror says uh, that uh, you told them that if the split in the result was 52% to remain and 48% to leave, then that would be unfinished business and that would be a reason to have a, a second referendum. In you know, because that's how Brexiters roll. You just need more referendums until you get the result you want. Because that's how democracy should work, right? Unless, of course, you win. In which case, you think that calling everyone else salty suddenly becomes a winning argument. Again, I can see the reaction in a couple of the rows there, you know, sort of whinging metropolitan losers. After um, an election or a referendum, even if you lose the vote, you are entitled to go on making the argument. When a government <laughs> in this country wins an election, the opposition does not just say, oh, that's absolutely right, I've got nothing to say for five years. <laughs> Well, I watched the interviews with Farage in the week or so after the referendum. Now, at the time, I was doing one of those 24-hour-7 experiments at a reactor, so making a video was just completely out of the question. However, it was bloody clear to me that Farage also had the demeanour of a broken man who had just made a career-ending mistake. Is it actually going to happen, or, or have the people who voted leave been sold a pup and been told that they can control immigration when, in fact, they can't? Well, we can control immigration. All we need is a Conservative Party government with the will to do it. After all that blowhard crap about all the UK wanted was freedom to democratically make its own decisions. It was amazing how when Scotland was making exactly the same argument, that all they wanted was the freedom to make their own decisions. But is, is losing Scotland a price worth paying for Brexit? All of a sudden, Farage thought that would be voting away their democracy. Is, is, is Nicola Sturgeon really going to hold a referendum against independence? Because that's what she'd be doing. I think I can see this is one of those irregular verbs. You know, I vote for independence, but when you do exactly the same thing and vote for home rule, you're voting away your freedom. Yeah. He knew it was a no-win situation. Like a dog that's been chasing a car that all of a sudden stops. You just had a load of confused Brexters looking at each other with that gaunt expression of, Dear God, we are so screwed. They were just empty promises. We never expected to win. People are going to lynch us when they realise that we only promised all of that stuff because we never expected to have to deliver on it. We never expected to win. Yeah, all that backpedalling couldn't have been more obvious. All of a sudden, you had people like Farrar saying, actually, yeah, we're probably going to need access to the common market after all, which will mean paying comparable amounts to Norway, which is a comparable amount to what the United Kingdom is currently paying for the EU. That is, Farage's deal is that we get no say, none whatsoever, not even a seat at the table on how the EU and the common market is run. But you will still have to pay about as much as you did before to get access to that common market. Damn, <laughs> Farage, I don't know why you didn't lead with that in the first place. It's such a, a vote winner. Nah, Project Fear was so much easier, wasn't it, Farage? But even better, free movement of people is a requirement of the free market, just like it is with Norway and Switzerland. So, in essence, it will do nothing, absolutely nothing, to increase the security of our borders. Oh, and what about all those Brexiters who were predicting that Brexit would lead to a cascade failure of that rotten EU structure? Before there was any second British referendum, there, there will be referendums on EU membership in Denmark uh, and possibly in France as well. So if Britain doesn't leave the European Union, it's possible that somebody else will do it before us. Don't underestimate, right across the whole of the European continent, people increasingly are saying this European project does not work. Did that one at least come to pass? Uh, not exactly. In fact, the UK's sterling example has led to a sharp drop in the popularity of nationalist parties across Europe. A drop almost as sharp 
as the drop in the pound, and it's led to an enhanced feeling of unity within the EU. So, let's see what Brexit has achieved, shall we? We're going to pay almost exactly what we currently pay. We have to accept the free movement of people within the EU zone. So that's exactly as it is at the moment. The only difference is you will no longer have a member of the EU Commission appointed by the Prime Minister. And you will no longer have members of the European Parliament. It'll cost you almost exactly what you're paying now for no extra border security. But of course, you will have no vote on how the EU is run. However, the change from one to the other will cost you a gazillion pounds. It will result in at least two years of insecurity, which will lead to investment atrophy within the UK. Further, it will probably lead to the movement of the United Kingdom financial services, which currently make up one sixth of the UK's GDP, to within the European Union zone, from which they will never return. Because honestly, moving an industry like that costs money. It's a barrier. Well, you've given them enough energy to cross that barrier. And once they're there, they're never coming back. So let's take a possible scenario where half the city locates to the Eurozone. You will reduce the GDP by, I don't know, let's say 10%, just, just a ballpark number. That's you're reducing the tax pool of the country by 10%. 10% less for schools, for roads, for policing your borders, for running the military, for the police force, and so forth. I mean, let me just put the scale of how screwed the UK is into perspective. The government's just put up 150 billion pounds for quantitative easing. That's 2,000 pounds for every man, woman, and child in the UK. That's the cost of four brand new iPhones for every man, woman, and child in the country. It's the equivalent of buying 40,000 tons of iPhones. That's about the same weight as a battleship of iPhones. That's the scale of the things that were needed to stabilize the UK. Well, let's see what the Brexit movie had to say about that, shall we? Isn't that good of them? I wonder where they got the money. Yeah, demonstrate that money doesn't come out of nowhere. Fundamentally, it's from the British public. So yeah, thus far, all the UK has done is have a non- binding referendum. It's not even publicly stated that it's going to leave the European Union. It's wiped 10% off the value of the pound. Oh, before the map it comes up with that, oh, but a low pound will be good for exports thing. Where have you been for the last 40 years? We're not China. We don't have a large manufacturing base to benefit from that weak pound. Nor does our manufacturing base have the ability to expand easily. Are you finished, Mr. Slade? No, I'm just getting warmed up. So it's wiped over 10% off the value of the pound. It's had the Bank of England standing by with last chance saloon quantities of money. It's lost the UK its prized AAA credit rating. Within a week or so of Brexit, something that it sweated blood to keep hold of during the last recession. And it set in motion at least two years of investment atrophy and threatened the financial services of the city relocating to the European Union. Yeah, all those Brexit campaigners have gone from cheering, adoring crowds, waving flags wherever they went, to meeting the people they've screwed over, to meeting the parents of the children who are going to be screwed over. And that's how it's going to be from now on. No wonder they were all quitting like flies. Oh, but you can't put a price on sovereignty, right? But the EU was going to make all the rules for us in some super state, right? You know, all that stuff about cucumbers and so forth. Well, sure, some of the rules the EU made were silly. But a lot more of them made sense. And honestly, can you really complain about all these oppressive laws that were stifling you within the European Union when you can't name a single one of them? A, you're yeah, asking people, no, but they're asking people yeah. to give up their sovereignty 
in, in the long term. That's the oh, goal. What, what sovereignty? Okay. Come on. No, 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 what what on. sovereignty? No, I want to know. What Go sovereignty on. have you given up for the union, for the EU? Okay, 50% of the laws are made by people I didn't like. Oh, shit. Right, name one of them. Well, I, just because I can't name one. Male fantasy games or male some fantasy of objectification of women games? Some of them, that would okay, be an some accurate of them. title, Which yeah. Would, give me some names. Give me some, I, name some names. I've read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like, what coming, one specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have... In the work that I do, I look at hundreds of examples of video games. So and can I you think of three? Can you think of three? I can't been in front of me over all these years um i, I have a bet man, but i think it's a, a bigger issue to talk about the industry as a whole and how it perpetuates i have a vast variety of sources where we get our news to um these ideas of sexism and misogyny as opposed to just grand theft auto for okay. example bullshit right name one of them well, I, just because I can't name one doesn't mean it's not true. Oh, come on, for fuck's yeah, sake. No, but this is what oh, they right. say. Oh, no, they no, no, say the EU is imposing all their, no, look, their horrible you, <laughs> burdens on me. The but European I have Commission's to have a website. Flame retardant label on my, my chair. Yeah, right? the, if, if that is the imposition, if that is the freedom that you've given up, it's bullshit. Look, that is the very beginning. Now, nah, these vapid popularists were happy all the time they were preaching to the converted. But when the shit hits the fan, damn straight I steed and took it in the neck. Meanwhile, where are all these popularists who only hung around while the people were cheering? When the shit hits the fan, some guys run and some guys stay. Here's Charlie facing the fire and there's George hiding in Big Daddy's pocket. Never to face the music of the wreckage of their empty promises. Well, when your esteemed leaders are the very first to desert the sinking ship, that should tell you something about the quality of their arguments or their belief in them. Not that any of these people are going to suffer, they're all mind-blowingly rich anyway. You know, people like Boris Johnson, member of the uh, Bullingdon Club, you know, where their initiation rights included things like burning a 50 pound note, that's like 50 bucks or something, in front of a homeless person. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. Now that's the stuff leaders should be made of. It just makes you wonder if this whole Brexit thing was just some lark by the Bullingdon Club to play with the, well, to play with the little people. But I know what you're thinking. It would have meant so much more if you'd have said beforehand that Brexit really wouldn't change Britain's overall position, but the change would cost the UK an arm and a leg. So, yeah, um, Brexit. Um, for what tangible gain? Um, the way I see it is a very expensive way. You, you, you've seen Red Dwarf, yeah? Love it. Yeah, it, you know, when Rimmer's repainting everything from ocean grey to military grey? Mm-hmm. Why? What the hell's the point of that? It's just a very expensive way of changing things from something to exactly... Something is a, a, a difference without a distinction, and it's just going to piss everyone else in the world off, which is about what you see. You take a look everywhere else in the world. No one else wants this because it's a sort of more or less pointless change. Now, interestingly, over the last week or so, I've not heard a peep out of all those Brexiters who were so mortified by the... Uh, slightly different implementation of democracy in the European Union to that of the UK. Now, I've not heard a peep out of them how the leading party is going to select two candidates for the next prime minister to be the leader of the country, and then only two people in every thousand will get a vote on which of those two people will become the next British prime minister. And you are bitching non-stop about how undemocratic the EU was. But when something like this happens, not a peep, where only two people in a thousand get a vote. And the average age of those voters is 59. And what? No attempts to change things. No referendum. No, no people even quitting. Yeah, it's odd how that selective outrage works, isn't it? Now, for me, I don't have too much problem with it in the UK. It's just like the EU democracy. It's fit for purpose. But I'm not going to have some selective vision about how there are problems with the EU Parliament while ignoring those of the UK. 
However, I did enjoy the massive backtracking of every leader of the Tories. I mean, the whole thing was a complete farce to begin with. The Conservatives are always looking to spend less money on everything, which is sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. But it's just hilarious. These people were taken in by the idea that if the UK managed to save 300 million a week, which of course they wouldn't, most of that 300 million a week was spent straight back on the UK for things like urban development or science or that sort of thing. The idea if they managed to save 300 million a week, they would suddenly spend it on the NHS was a joke. The 350 million pounds a week we send to the EU, which we will no longer send to the EU, can you guarantee that's going to go to the NHS? No, I can't. And I, and I would never have made that claim. That was one of the mistakes I think that the Leave campaign made. What Hang I on a moment. That was one of your adverts. Well, it wasn't one of my adverts, I can assure well, you. Oh, really, Nigel? So you wouldn't expect to find, say, footage of a UKIP MEP giving a speech in front of that exact same sign, would you? Do we want to be part of an insure, inward looking, little 1950s, little European vlog? No one tell the UKIP MEP that that tiny little backward European Union is the largest or maybe second largest economy in the world. I mean, he wouldn't want to let facts get in the way of his disinformation now. Well, it wasn't one of my adverts, I can assure well, you. Well, that was one of the Leave campaign's was, adverts, it was, was that it that was, money was going to go to the NHS. And I think they made a mistake. I would like that £10 million to be spent helping the communities in Britain that your government damaged so badly by you opening up the door for the communist country. What people need here are small hospitals, GPs. That's why many people have voted. They made a mistake in doing that. But what I can tell you is we have a nice feather bed. after 17 million people have voted for Leave, yeah. Based, I don't know how many people voted on the basis of that advert, but that was a huge part of the propaganda. You're now saying that's a mistake. Let alone the idea that they would suddenly develop a conscience over science funding. Oh, and by the way, for all those who thought I was a EU shill or something, don't let the fact that I'm not funded in any significant way by the EU fool you. EU funding for science is mostly fine. It's just the UK which is screwed. It's just they got a lot more money out of the EU for science than they put in. And I look forward to all you Brexiters campaigning for a Conservative government to restore funding parity to UK science. Yeah, congrats Brexiters, you just screwed over UK science. And for those of you in UK science who have been screwed by this, yeah, I'm sorry. But honestly, I took one in the neck for this. Anyway, like I was saying, Shortly after the Brexit, for a week or two, it looked like all the potential new leaders were going to play the uh, wait and see card. Uh, the, the wait and see on invoking Article 50. <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen that sort of thing before. Like the UK said when it was going to join the Euro. They were going to do it when the time was right. They had to meet five criteria for joining. And mm, yeah, what are we now? 15 years on and everyone's forgotten about it. Yeah, that's the sort of commitment I expected to invoking Article 50. Sure, it's a path that will cause years of investment atrophy in the UK. But the plan is politically acceptable because it doesn't require the political suicide of a politician. And really, who's going to complain about such a wait-and-see plan? I mean, doubtless there will be some hardcore Brexiters left, but maybe you should just remind them how you shouldn't take anything a democratically elected politician says too literally. However, then some folks turned up in the race who said no, they were going to invoke Article 50 as soon as possible. And look what that did for the pound. So now it looks like it's going to be a race between Theresa May, who actually campaigned against Brexit, leading to the obvious question, if she can be the leader of the Brexit, why couldn't Cameron? And then Leadsom who only three years ago described leaving the European Union as economic suicide. I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here. I don't think the UK should leave the EU. I think it would be a disaster for our economy and it would lead to a decade of economic and political uncertainty at a time when the tectonic plates of global success are moving. And she does have experience in the city and the Bank of England, and she's not one of the minus tiny band of lunatics no, lunatic, who think we can have a, a sort of glorious economic future she, outside the single market. Outside Europe, we could have prosperity on a level that we can't even imagine now. 
But so long as she understands that she's not to deliver on some of the extremely stupid things she's been saying. Yeah, with a mass suicide like this in British politics and the Shakespearean tragedy with a body count that makes Game of Thrones look distinctly PG-13, you wonder why no one else in Europe is interested in following Britain's example. It's a real sad irony in some ways, in that I had page after page of people saying that I was only doing this for self-interest, when in reality, exactly the opposite was the case. Personally, I had more to gain by the pound devaluing than staying in the Eurozone. For instance, if I were to move to the UK now, I could instantly afford 10% more than I could previously. However, that ain't how I roll. I didn't do this to win favor with people. Hell, that should have been obvious from the voting on the videos. I didn't do this for self-interest. I did it because I could see that it was a mistake of astronomical proportions. Astronomical proportions. I mean, you think Ken Hamblug, $100 million on the Ark Adventure Park was a joke. You ain't seen nothing. That would merely cover the salaries of the guys to negotiate Brexit. Just the salaries. And if you're lucky, Britain might have parity with where it was before. And that's just a chump change, because, you know, 40,000 tons of brand new iPhones. And sadly, while it does actually give me some pleasure to say, I told you so after weeks of bitter comments. The reality is the cost for me is some slight discomfort and some skin thickening of one man. The sad reality is this is going to screw over an awful lot of British people. And even sadder is one of the things Farage cited about why he was going to quit was he was getting death threats. Oh, really? Before UKIP, what do you think the chances of a pro-Remain member of parliament getting shot in the streets by a guy identifying himself as freedom for Britain, death to traitors? And even worse, in his victory speech, he said this. To win. Yeah. And we will have done it. We will have done it without having to fight without a single bullet being fired. He claimed that no one got shot in his revolution. Now, nah, wasn't quite true, was it, Farage? And now the man who thrived on the polarization for success is quitting because he's just too much of a pussy to face the train wreck he was instrumental in causing. Because, you know, his whole party was based around quitting something than trying to actually fix it, trying to make something better. I mean, what did you expect? Of course he was going to quit. That's the way you represent the United Kingdom Independence Party. <laughs> While the UK exists, of course, that is to set in motion the wheels that will lead to the destruction of the United Kingdom then. Pfft, I, you know, I've achieved everything I wanted to. I win. Now where's my MEP pension? I mean, I don't want to speak for history too much here, but my reckoning is he will be written up as one of these mindless popularists who was happy to milk the teat of nationalism till it looked like he was going to be held accountable for the empty promises he made. Then he decided he needed his life back. Oh, how fortuitous for him that he can laugh all the way to the bank on his MEP salary, which increased in value 10% now that the pounds devalued while all of those guys around him are suffering from the financial carnage he caused. But hey, it must be hard for him to relate so much to the uh, common man on his £85,000 a year salary for a job that he barely goes to. I figure the rest is a matter for history. But when people voted for Brexit, it seems pretty bloody clear that this clusterfuck was not what they voted for. And if they had to vote again today... We have fought against the multinationals. We fought against the big merchant banks. We fought against big politics. We fought against lies, corruption and deceit. Well, bit. that was one of the Leave campaign's adverts. It was, adverts, it was, was that, it that was, money was going to go to the NHS. And I think they made a mistake. That's why people, many people have voted. They, they, they made a mistake in doing that. Honesty, decency and belief in nation, I think now, is going to win. All the people that put their cross down for Leave saying, this is what we want... <laughs> 
they seem to be getting a group of people who say, we can't stop immigration, we can't give 350 million, oh, and um, by the way, there might be quite a lot of austerity. Sorry, bye. So it's an interesting test for British democracy. The result of the referendum was obtained through empty promises. And now it's clear that they're empty promises. And what the Brexiters were calling Project Fear was actually Project Reality. It seems that few would contest that the referendum result of only a few weeks back, which showed a, which showed a marginal desire to leave the EU, is no longer an accurate measure of the will of the people, due to facts that have since become self-evident. So it's an interesting test for democracy. Should the government blindly implement a referendum, which by almost any account is no longer an accurate measure of the will of the people? and is against the interests of the people? Or should it seek a more liberal interpretation of democracy? You know, like uh, where, I don't know, say, two people in every thousand in the country get to vote on the new prime minister, or, or some democratic issue like that. Anyway, I'll leave you with the sterling words of wisdom of one of the potential new candidates for prime minister, and what the Brexit will likely mean for the United Kingdom in financial terms. Take it away, Andrea. I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here. I don't think the UK should leave the EU. I think it would be a disaster for our economy and it would lead to a decade of economic and political uncertainty at a time when the tectonic plates of global success are moving. And she does have experience in the city and the Bank of England and she's not one of the minus tiny band of lunatics no, lunatic, who think we can have a, a sort of glorious economic future she, outside can, the single market. Outside Europe we could have prosperity on a level that we can't even imagine now. So long as she understands that she's not to deliver on some of the extremely stupid things she's been saying, 